Hello everyone, and welcome to BioScholar. Have you ever wondered why flowers bloom? Is it simply for beauty or aesthetics? Not quite. Flowers are the reproductive organs of plants, designed to help them multiply and ensure the survival of their species. And at the heart of this process lies something you've probably heard about many times in school. Pollination. But how does it actually work? In today's episode, we step into the fascinating world of plant reproduction to uncover the science behind one of nature's most vital processes. So, what is pollination? Pollination is nature's way of ensuring the next generation of plants. It happens when pollen, the tiny, dust-like grains from an anther, is carried to the stigma of the flower. This simple yet vital journey sets the stage for fertilization, allowing flowers to transform into seeds, fruits, and ultimately, new life. Remember pollination occurs between the plants of same species. To truly understand how pollination works, we first need to explore the structure of a flower, the very stage where this entire process unfolds. So, this is the structure of a flower. Here we have the stalk, which attaches the flower to the branch. These are the sepals, the outer covering that protects the flower bud before it blooms. Next are the petals, which vary in color across different flowers and are often scented. Both their color and fragrance play a critical role in attracting pollinators, something we'll discuss shortly. This is the andrisham, the male reproductive part of the flower, and this is the gynesium, the female reproductive part. To truly grasp how pollination happens, let's zoom in on these two structures and explore them in detail. The andrisham, also called the stamen, is made up of two parts, the filament and the anther. The filament is a slender, stalk-like structure that supports the anther at its tip. The anther is a sac-like structure where pollen grains are produced. Once these sacs mature, they burst open, releasing the pollen grains into the air or onto visiting pollinators. Pollen grains themselves appear as a fine, yellow dust, tiny but essential to the plant's reproduction. The gynesium, also called the pistil or carpel, is the female reproductive part of the flower. It is made up of three main structures, the stigma, style, and ovary. The stigma is the sticky, glue-like surface at the top, specially designed to catch and hold pollen grains. Beneath it lies the style, a slender, stem-like structure that forms a passageway for pollen tubes to grow. At the base is the ovary, a sac-like structure that houses one or more ovules. Each ovule contains a female gamete, or egg cell. Once fertilization occurs inside the ovule, it develops into a seed, and the ovary itself matures into a fruit. As you can see, some flowers contain both male and female parts. But did you know that not all flowers are like this? A flower that has both reproductive parts is called a bisexual flower, because both sexes are present in a single bloom. However, Flowers that have only one reproductive part, either male or female, are called unisexual flowers. For example, in plants like bitter gourd or cucumber, some flowers are male, producing pollen grains, while others are female, containing the stigma and ovary. For fruit to develop, pollen from a male flower must be transferred to the stigma of a female flower. These are the main types of flowers. Now, Let's return to our main topic, pollination. This part of the flower makes pollen grains, while this part produces ovules. For reproduction, the pollen must reach the stigma, and that's where pollinators step in. Pollinators fall into two groups, abiotic and biotic. Abiotic pollinators like wind and water carry pollen from one flower to another. The stigma's sticky surface catches and holds it, ready for fertilization. Biotic pollinators, birds, bees, and other animals, pick up pollen on their bodies while feeding on nectar. As they move from flower to flower, they unknowingly deliver this pollen to the stigma, setting the stage for new life to grow. Once the pollen lands on the stigma, it absorbs moisture and nutrients, triggering the growth of a slender pollen tube that begins its journey down through the style. 
Inside this tube are the male gametes, traveling with a single purpose. The tube extends until it reaches the ovary, where it is guided toward an ovule. Here, one male gamete fuses with the female egg cell inside the ovule. This moment of union forms a zygote, the very first stage of a new plant's life. After fertilization, the ovule develops into a seed, while the ovary swells and transforms into a fruit, protecting the seeds and helping them disperse. And when those seeds find the right conditions, they awaken, germinating into fresh new plants, and the cycle of life begins once again. But do you think this exchange of gametes only happens between the flowers of the same plant? Not at all. Pollination can occur in two main ways self pollination and cross pollination. In self pollination, the pollen from a flower's anther is transferred to the stigma of the same flower, or to another flower on the same plant. This method is quick and ensures reproduction, but it limits genetic variation. In cross pollination, the pollen travels from the anther of one plant to the stigma of a flower on a different plant of the same species. This method, often aided by wind, water, or pollinators, promotes greater genetic diversity and healthier plant populations. Oli nation is essential for the reproduction of most flowering plants and the production of fruits and seeds. Around 75 to 95 percent of all flowering plants rely on pollinators, and over 100 major crops depend on them. Bees, birds, bats, butterflies, beetles, and even some marine animals act as pollinators. At least 30% of the world's 1,500 crop species rely on bees and other insects for pollination. Pollinators support biodiversity by enabling plants to reproduce, which in turn feeds herbivores and predators in the food chain. They help maintain healthy ecosystems that stabilize soil, filter water, and produce oxygen. Without pollinators, global food production would decline sharply, threatening food security. One in every three bites of food you eat exists because of pollinators. Pollinator decline, caused by habitat loss, pesticides, pollution, and climate change, poses a serious ecological threat. Protecting pollinators is vital for sustaining life on Earth and ensuring the survival of countless plant and animal species. So, that's it for today's episode on pollination. I hope you discovered something new and fascinating about the hidden life of flowers. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.